Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Lazy Real Talk. Sorry for the delay. I was reading the comments and uh, I think I put uh, one annoying Wu Mao uh, in timeout mode. So that took me a while to, to, to do. So sorry for the late start. Uh, okay. All right. So we'll talk about Sano US relations. We have not talked about this for, for a while. Um, Okay, I think I put him in a timeout mode. All right. Anyways, um, so for the past year, there are there are two topics that drove the direction of geopolitics, right? One is war in Ukraine and the other is Sino-US relations. But ever since Xi Jinping's visit, state visit to Russia last month, the two topics have merged to become one. Uh, the Cold War between US and China has become the force that drives geopolitics, whether in Ukraine or in the Taiwan Strait. Um, the United States' longstanding strategic ambiguity and the one China policies are becoming counterproductive, in my opinion. And the Biden administration needs to develop a new China policy. So tonight I'll specifically talk about um, <clears throat> one, uh, basically, I'll talk about the strategic ambiguity and the one China policy sort of together because they are uh, they're related. And then I will talk about a reciprocity strategy. And then um, last but not least, I want to talk about the importance of addressing to the Chinese people. Uh, so since the spy balloon incident, U.S. Rela US China relations have entered a new chapter in which China seems to be more eager to decouple while the United States is trying to hold hands. Um, the, more, the most dramatic move is obviously Xi Jinping's visit to Russia and his last comment to Putin about China and Russia driving the changes. Um, what he said, he said the, the, the changes, the likes of which the world has not seen for 100 years. And after returning to China, she welcomed French President Emmanuel Macron with open arms. And Macron was so impressed that when he left China, he talked like a, a Xi Jinping disciple, for lack of a better term. Actually, I'll have a picture. I saw this picture and I just want to make a comment on that. And the, do you guys see a problem in this picture? I do. Um, he he did not bring his own translator. the the the, the only translator is uh, the chi from the Chinese from the China side, because she's wearing a mask that has a the China flag on it, and I think this is a problem. Um, he should at any time. I mean, this, I think as part of the diplomatic protocol, you should always bring your own translator, um, because the Chinese. I have listened to a lot of these translated recordings or translated scripts or um, the Chinese translators are very good. They're, they're, um, they're trained very well. However, they have one problem. They will tune out. They will make their leader's speech um, lacking personality. It will, it will always sound like perfectly politically correct. It will take out all the nuances from their speech they don't practice like the you should be like very faithful in your in your translation right even their tone their their emotions like if you're a good translator that's what you should do um but i've noticed that the mainland chinese translators don't, they don't do that they always give you this perfect translation that's that would not cause any diplomatic heartburns or um or uh or incidents, shall we say. So they tune down many things. And you miss the chance as a visiting, um, uh, as someone visiting China, you should bring your own translator so he or she can listen um, and take note of the nuances in the language that Xi Jinping uses. So it's so when I saw that, I'm like, why does he do this? Doesn't he know the importance of having your own translator? Even if it doesn't do the translation, he could take note of all the things he observed quietly. And, and there's so much to watch. Um, that's why I don't use the, the tra official translations uh, that China has. I mean, it's just, I, I just 
you know, it's, it's no good. You miss the best part, shall we say. Okay, so <laughs> that's, a, that's a, just a side note. I saw this picture. I wanted to share that with you. Um, <laughs> where are we? Okay, let's back to Sun of U.S. Relations. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, and then, okay, so after Macron visited China, then, uh, you know, I mean, there was a, a whole series of events, right? Um, the, first, he visited Russia, and then Macron visited China, and then there's China gaining more influence in, in the Middle East. And then, uh, well, the region used to be dominated by the United States. And then... What really piqued my interest was um, U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken uh, wanted to resume discussions with China about his visit to, Ch uh, to the country uh, because it was canceled after the spy balloon. But then um, China rejected him. China is not interested in having him over. Um, so Beijing has sent clear signals that it's ready to decouple with the United States. So what has the United States been doing? Well, it has been it has continued to do what it does best, which is expanding its alliances by solidifying relations with South Korea and the Philippines, right? By conducting um by creating military alliances or 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 further their military cooperations with South Korea and Philippine the Philippines. So and also, Joe Biden has been careful not to annoy Xi Jinping by delaying the, the release of the investigation report of the spy balloon. So decoupling is a concept that the U.S. initiated, but now th China is, seems to be more eager to decouple. Um, so, here, so here's the question. So the United, without a doubt, the United States has the world's strongest military. But CCP is the most manipulative regime. The question is, will the world, uh, will the country with the strongest military win the Cold War against the most manipulative, manipulative regime? All right, that's the question. In my mind, not necessarily. Um, the CCP doesn't have a good track record of winning wars um, on battlefields, but it it has been successful in manipulating opinions. So if the United States only focus on its military strength um, and building alliances to deter Beijing's aggression, um, in, in, my for, in my fall short in its effort. So, so in my view, the United States needs to correct four, I call it mistakes. Okay, I'll justify calling them mistakes later. I think the United States needs to, needs to correct four mistakes in its Sino-U.S. policies. Uh, the first is, is it's time to replace the strategic ambiguity policy with something else. And the strate strategic ambiguity um, policy is in regards to Taiwan, right? I mean, the... The, the center, the focal point of Sino-U.S. competition or, or, or Cold War or whatever you call that is Taiwan. So, um, so, so it's essentially it evolves around the uh, relations with Taiwan. Um, so let me talk about the strategic ambiguity policy. The longstanding policy is understood as deliberately creating uncertainty in Beijing and tai Taipei about whether the United States would intervene in war. But that's already obsolete because now we already know that the United States would intervene, right? So, the, so by, by nature of the, the definition, it's already obsolete. Um, and then part of the strategic ambiguity policy is the one China policy. The two are like the two sides of a coin um, that the U.S. has, uh, hold, has hold on to for decades. But these two policies have hurt more than helped the Americans, because they have been misunderstood and miscommunicated um, and also manipulated by Beijing. So let's take a look how this started. So the United States and China formally established diplomatic relations in January 
um, um, in 1979, right? And then so that year, the Carter administration officials explained at a hearing that while the U.S. recognized China's position that Taiwan was part of China, they also emphasized that the, that the United States itself does not agree with this Chinese position. So the United States does not agree China's claim that Taiwan is part of China. Okay, and in fact, both the Taiwan Relations Act in, enacted by the U.S. Congress in 1979 and also the, the later, the Re Reagan administration's Six Assurance to Taiwan in 1982 were built on the premise that Taiwan is not part of China and that U.S. arms sales to Taiwan and other commitments to Taiwan did not constitute interference in China's internal affairs. And even after the signing of the three U.S.-China uh, what do you call it, communic, communic, communic? Uh, it's a French word. The U.S. government still considered Taiwan's legal status, uh, it considered Taiwan's legal status undetermined and denied China's sovereignty over Taiwan. Um, so, and then even shortly after the signing of the August 17th, 1982 diplomatic conference, the U.S. State Department submitted a written reply to the Senate and to assure that the United States does not take positions on Taiwan's sovereignty. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the Americans don't have an opinion on Taiwan's sovereignty. What that says is the United States does not take a particular position um, on the ultimate resolution of the Taiwan sovereignty dispute. And it's basically just not making it public or not making it clear what its position is. So this is really the origin of the, str of the strategic ambiguity, or this uh, has an important role uh, in, the <clears throat> in, 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 in this strategic ambiguity policy. However, this policy has confused Americans, Americans, America's own officials. Because in order to promote an engagement policy toward China, the U.S. government has avoided public discussion of the legal status of Taiwan since the 1970s and avoided challenging China's claim that Taiwan is part of China. So in particular, the, the, the flexibility and the deliberate ambiguity of Washington's One China policy is often misunderstood um, as being identical to Beijing's One China policy principle, but it's not. Um, in September 1994, President Clinton's White House press secretary, Mike McCurry, was asked whether the U.S. government considered Taiwan to be part of China. He replied, yes, and that has been a consistent feature of our One China policy. That was a, a, a mistake, and he corrected it later on. He corrected the statement later on. So as time goes on, and as the original designers of this policy have passed on, more American politicians got confused. And so on April 21st, 2004, um, former U.S. Secretary of State, or he might be the Assistant Secretary of State at the time, um, or maybe, maybe Secretary of State, James, James Kelly, admitted the difficulty of defining the U.S. one China policy. He said, I'm not sure I very easily could define it. He said, I can tell you what it's not. He said, it's not the one China principle that Beijing suggests. So, so much such confusion can only um, lead to long-term miscalculations and also um, uh, a hardening position by the CCP, right? So over time, over time, the one China policy that the United States originally um, de designed has become something that it's not. Um, over time, it has been misunderstood or miscommunicated to become very close to Beijing's version. Um, and Beijing is now holding the U.S. accountable for, you know, for its promise of one China, but but the United States has not has has not promised such. Um, 
And also the other reason that this policy need to go or needs to go is the strategic ambiguity policy has been in place to maintain status quo, meaning that Taiwan won't declare independence while mainland won't use force uh, against Taiwan. And so maintaining status quo has been the United States objective. But when the CCP has openly adopted the policy that using for, that they do not rule out the use of force to achieve Taiwan unification, then this status quo is broken, um, right? The, so the condition to maintain this strategic ambiguity is, is lost. And therefore the United States should immediately replace it with a, a strategic clarity policy. Otherwise, the CCP will perceive um, the lack of clarity as a weakness, and it will definitely embolden the CCP. Um, now, in August 2020, so so what do you? So the question is, well, what do you what do you recommend? Well, what's our solution if we get rid of those if we get rid of those um, policies? What do we do? Um, I want to show a slide. This, yeah, there's an article. <clears throat> published in August 2020 by the Foreign Policy Magazine. And the title says, Re Reciprocity is a tool, not a strategy against China. And it says in the subtitle, <coughs> excuse me, tit for tat tactics are sometimes necessary, but rarely effective. Um, I think the headline reflects the third mistake that, that the United States has. I think this title got it wrong. It should be the other way around. Reciprocity should be the strategy, not a tool. Um, when reciprocity is used only as a tool, it's not effective on, on the CCP. I'll show you an example later. Most people who don't support this view argue that, well, it's equally dangerous if the CCP is provoked as they may get irrational or they may start a war, right? And we want to avoid that. That seems to be the argument on, on the opposite side, um, people who disagree with this view. Well, I want to say that CCP leaders, a group of um, the most calculating group of individuals who are very thick skinned. Um, I don't think the CCP is easily provoked, although they will appear provoked to make you think so. So far, their tactic has worked because there, there, there has always been a group of people in the West who are very concerned uh, to provoke the CCP. If you watch, if you have watched my CCP war, uh, motivation for war series, I made three videos on CCP's motivation for war. You will see that they don't launch a war to defend its reputation they don't launch a war to defend its borders or even land uh, because unlike, other, unlike most nations, it really doesn't care about its reputation. Although it will, it, will, it will appear that it cares, but in their heart, they don't care. It does not care about its loss of land or its borders. Uh, it launches war for there for something they care for for ulterior motives that is solving an internal political crisis or gaining externally gaining occurring favors externally so don't think ever think that just because they're so loud and so um nasty it means that they care about their reputation no um the biggest challenge the West has in dealing with the CCP is it doesn't follow any rules, right? It says one thing and doesn't another. Well, it's why? Because it does not want to follow the rules the West has set. I mean, most of basically the United States is the leader um, of the free world. So when the CCP has the objective to replace the United States one day, so obviously it's not going to follow any rules set by the United States and its allies, because by following your rule, um, it's endorsing you. So it won't. Don't ever expect the CCP will follow the, your rule. It will not. Um, so the only way to make the CCP behave uh, 
is to ask the CCP to follow the same rules it has imposed on others, right? And that's what I mean by reciprocity strategy. So let me give you an example. Um, I want to share a picture. So on, I think this is April 15th or on about April 15th, Wang Yi, China's highest ranking diplomat, um, his title is director of the CCP's Central Foreign Affairs Office, met with German foreign minister. Her name is Annalena, uh, Annalena Baerbach. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right in Beijing. Um, Chinese press reported the meeting and said Wang Yi made this comment to his um, German guest. Wang said, China had supported Germany to achieve reunification, and he hopes and believes that Germany will also support China's great cause of a peaceful reunification. Um, Ms. Baerbach said, uh, said this, according to the, to the media report, this is what the, the German foreign minister said. She said, it's important for China as a permanent member of the UN Security Council and Germany, a major European country, to strengthen dialogue and communication between the two, uh, between the two countries. Um, and then Germany strictly adheres to the one China policy. Sometimes I'm amazed that our politicians are trained to say things so perfectly that don't mean anything substantial. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, what she said is perfect, right? It's perfectly correct and nothing wrong with that and means well, but does not, does not create any splash, shall we say, in geopolitics. I think... Um, Ms. Baerbach missed the perfect opportunity to say something meaningful to the Chinese. Um, and China's Wang Yi gave her a platform and she didn't use it. Uh, but it's not her fault because she didn't have, um, or, or the West does not have a, a policy of, uh, re, what do you call it, reciprocity strategy. If the West does a, adopt the strategy of reciprocity, then she could say something like this. Okay, this is the script I wrote for her. Okay, um, it has a it has an element of entertainment in it because it's Saturday night. I I just um, I think I put on I put on I put a certain humor in it. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so this is what she should tell the, the Wang Yi. She he, she should say this. Thank you, Director Wang, for bringing, for bringing up German unification. Germans are very proud of their peaceful unification more than 30 years ago. And I hope our experience can offer the Chinese from both sides of the Taiwan Strait a good reference. I want to point out that the German unification is one, peaceful in nature, and two, it was the result of the 1989 revolution known as the fall of communism. And three, the unification, the German unification was preceded by the first open general election in East Germany when people voted on March 18th, 1990. We encourage China and Taiwan explore a peaceful path to unification. And I hope you, Director Wan, and your government will support this endeavor just like you've supported the German unification. And if her government is courageous enough, uh, she could even add this. She said, well, we'd like to maintain normal relations with China and Taiwan before the peaceful unification takes place. Just like the PRC, China had maintained diplomatic relations with both East and West Germany before the unification. I hope Director Wang will understand and support us. Well, I don't know. I add a certain uh, element of entertainment to that. So I don't know what would happen if um, she made that speech. But if Tony Blinken says this uh, to Wang Yi when he visits China or, or if he has already said this uh, to Chinese, I think the world is a different place today. Uh, but anyway, so that's what I mean by uh, that's an example to show why reciprocity 
tool does not work because it only works when it's elevated to, to a strategy level. Only, only when you have it as a strategy, then our diplomats can, can, can apply it, right? Uh, based on the, the, the situation and, and this, the, 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 yeah, the scenario. But if it's only a tool, it's lacking strength. You, what can you do? Um, so, and we have another example I want to show you. So on April 21st, um, oh, here, I have a picture of um, the German unification. So here's another example. So on April 21st, in Shanghai, there's a, there's a forum called the Blue, Blue Room Forum. I literally translate it. I don't know what it is, but there's a name. It's called Chinese Modernization and the World. Is that what you see on the in the photo? Yes, China, Chinese Modernization and the World. That's the theme of the forum. It was held in Shanghai, and China's newly promoted foreign minister, foreign minister Qin Gang, delivered a keynote speech, and he said that Taiwan has been an inseparable part of China's territory since ancient times, and that both sides of the Taiwan Strait belong, uh, belong to the same China, which is Taiwan's history and its current situation. And he said, the return of Taiwan to China is part of the post-World War II international order. The Cairo Declaration is written in black and white, and the, uh, it's called the Potsdam. Am I pronouncing it right? The Potsdam? Pots, Potsdam? proclamation is clearly printed. Now, um, if you're familiar with history, and then I think people need to immediately respond to Qing Gang by telling, reminding him the Cairo Declaration uh, was the outcome of the Cairo Conference in November 1943. Um, it was signed by President Franklin Roosevelt uh, Winston Churchill and uh, General Jiang Kai-shek of the Republic of China. And it, the declaration set the goals for the post-war post order. And the, the Potsdam Declaration is the, is the one um, that defines the terms for, Japan, for Japan's surrender during World War II. It was signed on July 26, 1945 by then U.S. President Harry Truman, and then Winston Churchill, and then also Jiang Kai-shek, General Jiang Kai-shek of the Republic of China. So the word, people should say, "Hey, we should we welcome China's <laughs> China's recognition of Taiwan and its government." Because here, when Qing Gang, you know, used the Cairo Declaration, used the two declarations as justification for Taiwan. And what is he talking about? I mean, the PRC did not exist yet during those, you know, when those two declarations were signed. Those were signed by ROC. So the fact that he reiterated them, that means he uh, acknowledged the government of ROC, the Republic of China, right? So, so we, um, yeah, we should immediately say, well, great. You know, it seems that you recognize the um, the Taiwan government, the Republic of China, uh, because it, it they really existed before the PRC ever did. So, yeah, we therefore should recognize them as well. You recognize them, we recognize them. <laughs> so you see how because, because of our ambiguous policy, we, because of our China policy that that's three decades old and it it doesn't mean a whole lot. It's only causing confusion. Our diplomats' hands are tied. We cannot respond to China. You know, for decades, you see like China, you know, saying the same thing, one China, one China policy. And then the whole world just fall echoed it, even though we don't mean to echo echo them. And so it's so, so the so the the response by the German foreign minister to Wang Yi's comment was the perfect example. It's so weak. It's saying nothing. It does not gain Germany anything. It does not gain West anything. It only adds. It only helps China 
to reiterate one China policy because everybody, when people hear that, they assume it's it's it, it, removing Taiwan. Because when you say one China, people think, oh, one China, then there's no Taiwan. But that's not what it meant. So we should stop this and adopt the policy of reciprocity. Um, whatever China uh, acknowledges, we should um, follow follow suit, right? Um, hold China accountable for the for the same policy that that it that it holds. Um, and then the fourth mistake that I think the United States has made is it has ignored the Chinese people. So the Cold War between China and the United States has been ongoing for decades. The United States just hadn't hadn't been aware until re in recent years. And one of the secret wars uh, the CCP has fought is it has included the public in the war. Uh, the CCP is very good at using mass people movement to justify its cause because it's a, it's an ideological it's an ideological war. It's not a political war only. It's an ideological war, so it has to involve its people. So the CCP has hijacked the Chinese people on its wagon um, by way of well, one example is the civilian military hybrid programs, right? Um, but it also targets the American public uh, through its programs, such as the United Front Work Department. I mean, no other government has programs like the United Front Work Department. That's unique to the CCP. But what, what does that department do? It's targeting the public in foreign countries. Right. So and it has a budget higher than um, it has the budget bigger than the, the budget of the, its foreign ministry. So. But the United States does not have has not put lots of focus um, on the Chinese people. It, it just focused on the CCP, the government. Right? The United States government just focused on the Chinese government and the CCP officials. When the CCP has focused, has targeted on everyone, our public, our government, our business. Um, and so that's why it's, of course, I'm not suggesting that the American government does the same thing as the CCP does. Um, I'm not trying to say that they should you know, get the Chinese to subvert their government. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is the United States government should not be carried away in its competition or in the Cold War with the CCP. Um, but it should do things um, that are good for the Chinese people, such as giving them access to uncensored information. And that the United States government should make a clear distinction between the Chinese people and the CCP, because the political party does not represent the country. The political party does not represent its people. Um, and this will help the United States uh, action be understood and, and, and not be misunderstood by the Chinese people. Because if you don't make that distinction, then the CCP can say, well, they're just against China. They're just against you. They're against, you know, you, the Chinese people. So we need to clearly make a distinction between the Chinese people and the CCP and have programs for the people that are different uh, from, 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 the, from the CCP. And this is something that the United States government have ignored. It does not have any program to address this problem. Um, so to summarize, because of this, because of the ambiguity in its strategy, the United States one China policy has changed in meaning over time without us being aware. And the rest, unfortunately, the rest of the world has followed or have accepted China's one China policy um, blindly. And, and the CCP has gotten away with what it wanted. Um, CCP doesn't allow other nations to acknowledge Taiwan or AOC. It's trying to further cut China's diplomat. I mean, it has tried to further cut Taiwan's diplomatic ties, and it has not allowed Taiwan to join organizations such as World Health Organization. And the United States and the West has have allowed China, right? They 
they have kind of allowed the CCP to do that under its ambiguous one China policy. So these are all the price um, we have paid or Taiwan has paid under that ambiguous policy. Uh, but now what do we do? Well, China maintains relations with both North and South Korea. The United States and the rest of the world should tell the CCP, you need to follow the same rules you set for us. If you want us, if you want us to accept your one China policy, you need to follow the same rule by picking either North or South Korea. If you can maintain diplomatic relations with both North and South Korea, then we can maintain diplomatic relations with both Republic of China and People's Republic of China. Um, when democratic nations on a large scale do this, I think it will effectively deter the CCP. Um, I think that ought to be the rule. I'm just surprised that not a lot of Western politicians have, have been doing this. Uh, and it's totally with reasons. Um, anyways, that's just, um, <laughs> wow, I've talked for 40 minutes already. It's, I did, it doesn't feel like 40 minutes, but that's my, my take on uh, where Sino-US relations or policy, sh policy should go from here. All right. Uh, as you can tell, I have enjoyed, uh, <laughs> It's it's entertaining. I should say politics is entertaining sometimes. All right. Let me see if people have questions for me. All right. Um, from Brian Cow. Thank you. Thank you for the super sticker. From Richard Zaira. Zaira. Lei, thank you for the informative videos. What can people in the U.S. do to have a positive impact in China? Also, do you think Chinese people want democracy? Of course they do. Of course they do. Um, I think what Americans can do is just spread the truth. Let people know. Just give people uncensored information. That would be the easiest, you know. Tell things as they are, as they ought to be told. Um, I think that would be the biggest help. Without, uh, that would be the safest, the most cost effect effective, and then the the most benign and gentle way to do it. And the CCP can't say anything. Why do you have to censor your internet? The whole world have access to internet. Why Chinese people can't access internet? You know. <laughs> Right? They're entitled to, to, to have access to, to the internet. For Mark Schwartz, Schwartzberg, we are very grateful for your insights. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. Uh, all right. Okay. Let me see. From Silas. Larson question. Wouldn't you say that democracy by their nature tend to delay taking tough geopolitical stances? It seems to me they repeatedly are slow to deter. Um, are they slow? Well, they're not slow on Russia. You know, I always say, I, I said this once, I, you know, they, I mean, I don't know if it's still ongoing, but you know the whole world reacted to Russia's invasion of of Ukraine. I mean, I mean we should, but I think sometimes we overreact. I mean, the I use the 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 story of um, the Russian soprano who 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 sang at the Metropolitan Opera in New York, and I think she was um, she was let go, and then. Other countries canceled her con concert because she was considered a friend of Putin. But she might be a friend with with uh, Vladimir Putin. But I don't think right now, if you ask her publicly, are you still a friend? I don't think she would say, I am. But take a look at Xi Jinping. I mean, he went there <laughs> and calling him dear friend. And then yet the West is very understanding. 
You know, as, as long as you don't sell, as long as you don't sell lethal weapons to Russia, then we're not, we're, we, we can tolerate that. It's obviously double standard. It's double standard. Double standards. So, um, so I don't, I don't agree that the West is always slow in taking tough geopolitical stands. I think sometimes it does take very tough geopolitical stands. Sometimes it does not. And so the question is, well, are they clear on when they should and when they should not? If they're consistently taking tough geopolitical stance, then I'm okay. Or if they're consistently not taking, I'm also okay. But it seems that they have been picking one over the other. And they have been very, very lenient to, um, to the CCP. Um, yeah. From Moonwalker... Hi, Lei. Given China's reputation, what do you think are the chances of China backstabbing Russia to take outer Manchuria and more territor ter territory when Russia is weakened by the Ukraine war? I think it's very likely. I think, um, but here, here's the argument. Okay, so there are two schools of thought. Um, one school believes that China wants to see a, uh, a weakened Russia so that it can take advantage of Russia like what you said it can take like outer Manchuria or take some territory from um, from back from Russia um, that's one school of thought the other school of thought is no that's not what CC CCP does not care about the loss of land I mean under CCP's rule China lost so much land um, but what China would fear is if Russia really, let's say, falls apart um, or even break up into smaller countries, there will be instabilities in Central Asia. And then that's in China's backyard. And China would be more concerned. Um, it's, not, it's not helping China when Russia breaks up and, you know, there are regional um, conflicts in that in that in that territory, it means more trouble for China because it, it's in its backyard. So the other school of thought believes that China is interested in in, in that's why it wants Russia to want want Putin to um, not not fall or not not be defeated too terribly. Um, so there are two schools of thoughts. I just share that. I don't know which one is. I think. I tend to agree with the second school of thought. I think that that thought is more like CCPs. Yeah. Edward Green, are you going to post this on Rumble? I think I'm already on Rumble. It's automatically updated. Um, from Voices on Espanol, why aren't there more Chinese living in the West doing what you're doing, speaking out and expressing their opinions? Good question. Um, I think they are, I think not until the United States government, you know, do more to protect the Chinese Americans who speak up. Um, the, the U.S. government recently arrested two individuals in New York in, uh, who helped set up the, the overseas Chinese police station. Remember the, the CCP is setting up um, what do you call that police stations in in other countries. This is, I think, the United States government need to do more to stop these illegal activities. Um, only when that happens, Chinese communities here will feel safe. People will feel protected. They are then they will become, they will be able to speak up more. Um, because if you go to Chinese communities here, you know, I, I talked to one subscriber and he, he feels very lonely. Um, people are afraid. People feel like they're being watched by the CCP. And this is in America. And so, and, and we're, you know, tax paying citizens, you know, our government, the U.S. government need to protect us. Shouldn't let the CCP to come in, have a, a free reign. Um, on this land. So, so the U S government need to do more. So when that, until that happens, more Chinese will speak, more Chinese Americans will speak up. Uh, 
Okay, so um uh Jeff Ramos Lay, the CCP announced that they overcounted 10 million of their people youth. Its truth was uh they have lost so much so many people during COVID. It has to sooner or later it will the data discrepancy will catch up with them. You know, in a few years, in, in, in a matter of a year, you will see something will change. Uh, I hope there are satellite technology that can actually find out how many people are living in China. I said, there's no way you can find out how many people died. The only way you can find out is how many people are still in China. Uh, I hope, I wish, I don't know, maybe there is a technology, maybe Elon Musk can do something. Um, they need to find out how many people are still living in China. That will solve the mystery. <laughs> so these bits and pieces of information to say, oh yeah, oh, by the way, we overcounted this age group. We overcounted that age group is CCP's way to trying to remedy its huge population gap. Um, you'll hear that from time to time, but it's too small. It's it, the gap is much bigger. So from Ed C, why was China so proud that the Ukrainian president acknowledged the one China policy in his call with Xi? Well, I just explained that. It's because the one China policy the world has altered the meaning of one China policy. China's semantics is one China principle. The one China policy is the American verbiage, um, but the, the American one China policy is not Beijing's one China principle. But because of the strategic ambiguity, the meaning has been changed. So people assume it's the same thing now. So when... Um, Zelensky acknowledged it. I'm sure China is very happy. You know. The BMW incident shows the effects the CCP has on the Chinese people. Don't blame the Chinese people. It would not be like in a democratic China. I agree. Um, I later saw another a vlogger, a Chinese vlogger in China who said that it was a setup. Someone, there was a company, there was a company, uh, uh, an automobile company uh, in Shanghai that organized that whole episode. Now, who is behind that company is a good question, right? So, so it looks like it's staged. I, but I can't verify. I just heard somebody. I read somebody came out to say this is this is staged, and that person gave a lot of evidence. Um, so, anyways, um, uh, Sumiland. I think they arrested more illegal China police in several U.S. cities. They indicted 40-some people, but most of the policemen they um, on the indictment are still in China. Um, they're not in the U.S. So the number of people they arrested in the U.S. is a, a very small percentage of the people who, who they charged. Yeah. Um, from Nurex GPT. Lei, I must share something of dire importance with you concerning China's demographics. Okay, great. Send me email. Um, my email is in the description section. Um, from Frosty Flake, thank you. Great presentation and thoughtful. Thank you. All right. Uh, let me see. Any other questions? Let me see. Sumiland, why did CCP make U.S. celebrities like Rock Maid, uh, whatever that name is, for calling Taiwan a country? It was about four years ago. I'm not familiar with that incident. So 
I will have to get back to you on that. I, I'm, yeah, I'm not familiar with that at all. From voices on Espanol, what do the Chinese think of France? Is French a popular language for Chinese people to learn? <laughs> That's a good question. I want to, I want to share something with you. You know how uh, the French president, after returning from China, he posted on social media. I don't know if it's Twitter. Maybe it's Twitter. He said he was so happy to meet so many young Chinese who study the French language and who are passionate about the French culture, French art, and you know opportunities to collaborate with with France. And then um, the next thing, you know, I saw a Chinese um, a social media so, uh, influencer said, hey, you know, like I've been doing business. I've been in China for, you know, for all these years. Like, you know, like when Chinese talk about doing business, they always talk about doing business with the Americans, with the Canadians, with the Australians. Um or, or like they, the, when, they, when they talk about making money with uh, with foreigners, they always talk about the Americans, the Australians, the Japanese, the Taiwanese, um, the Canadians. And he said, I never heard people say, hey, I want to do business with the French. <laughs> and, said, and then you know, he was talking on his program. He said, have you heard? You know, I said, yeah, we, we don't. We Chinese don't. You know, when it comes to do business or have some kind of a collaboration. We never thought about the French. They're not important to us. So I saw it's such a slap in the face. Um, <laughs> maybe I should make a short. And I don't know if, if somebody can translate that for Emmanuel Macron. Um, I, I think I don't mean to insult him or anything, but that's really the reality. Uh, yeah, that's just, that's just the reality. I think it's very true. Yeah. Um, all right. So I think I have gone, come to the bottom of the questions. Uh, I just answered that, France. Okay. Uh, last question. Alan Mendel, does CCP acknowledge IT manufacturing leaving with the unemployed? going to India. What do you mean acknowledge? Does the CCP acknowledge IT manufacturing? Um, you mean it's press or it's officials? I know the, I read um, the latest Politburo meeting, or Xi Jinping recently made a speech at a Politburo meeting and his speech sounds sounded like he's very concerned about the economy. If you read between the lines, I don't think they ever, when they talk, they ever address, they don't let their concerns be known, like that specific. Oh, I'm concerned about IT leaving China, going to uh, going to India. No, they will never say it to save their face, right? To, um, but it's he's very concerned with the, with the, with the economy. Um, so I don't think you will see them talk about it. From Sir Humphrey. Thank you, sir, for, for, for the, donation um so let me see is that all that's all that's all the questions i get oh oh here uh, from voices on espanol please do a future short video about china and the french the current chinese ambassador to france speaks french very well yes he does i i listen to him speaking french i am I'm, I'm impressed but then what he said is embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> his language, his language capability is very good, but his what he said was such a uh, such a disgrace. Alrighty, that's all for tonight. Thank you very much for joining me. It's been one hour, and um, enjoy the rest of the weekend. I'll see you next week. Alrighty, bye. <laughs>